from one of those deep afternoon naps. You know the kind when you first open your eyes and you go, where am I? What time is it? What day is it? What country am I in? What happened yesterday? What's going on tomorrow? And then I, I opened my eyes a little wider and I looked up and I saw this ceiling fan going whoomph for the whoomph for the whoomph for the swaying on a frayed wire like it's about to crash down on my head. I assess the situation. I'm naked. I'm bathed in sweat. Got it. Got it. Got it. Now I remember, I'm in Haniara, the capital of the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. I'm on the right page. What's next? 
I have to pee. I really have to pee. Okay. Oh, just a second. I'm stuck to the sheets and dried blood. Oh, no. Okay. I'm going to just sit back and relax. I'm not going to go. I'm just, oh, no, I really have to go. Okay. I rip myself off the sheets and fall down onto the floor, you know, and I'm down there looking around, thinking about getting it up, and there's something wrong with this picture. There's definitely something wrong. I remember now, clear as a, as a bell, before I went to bed, I went running around the room, killing cockroaches. And then, in a rare act of domesticity, I brushed them all into a little pile and swept them under the bed. They're not there. This is indeed curious. So, I really have to pee. Oh, okay. So I go to the bathroom just in time to see the mystery solved. There's a long string of ants and the last of them are crawling down that mysterious hole by the side of the toilet, that yellow brown hole, and they're carrying the cockroaches away. <laughs> Got it, mystery solved, okay. I go back to bed, oh boy, whoa. But I can't fall asleep, you know, when you wake up from that kind of a nap, it's, it's not a repeat performance. So my brain starts doing what Brains are trained to do, but as a real pain, they start thinking about life, you know? And I'm lying there and I'm thinking, I'm 64 years old. What am I doing in this cheap hotel in Haniara? All banged up. Yeah. Well, it's too deep a philosophical question to ask, you know? It's a stupid question. but. Let's narrow it down from all of life. You know, where did I go wrong? You know, Freudian questions of what my relationship with my mother is, why I ended up here in this cheap hotel. Let's, let's simplify it. I'm here because the crocodile didn't eat me. And that's where we're going to start. Okay. Uh, on this trip, I was doing a long solo kayak along the Solomon Islands, traveling from island to island, along passages, and I was kind of getting beat up on these passages. In between islands, the currents were much stronger than I expected them to be. I kept getting washed out to sea. I kept hitting steep waves. I kept having a rough time out there. So I had another crossing, and I said, OK, I'm not going to be stupid this time. What I'm going to do, there's a nice white coral sand beach here just before this next crossing. You know, I'm alone. There's no pressure. I don't really have to be anywhere at any time. There's lots of coconuts to eat. I'm going to sit on this beach for a couple days, and I'm going to analyze the situation. I'm going to look at the tides. I'm going to watch the movement of the tides. I'm really going to think about this. I'm going to make this crossing cleanly so I don't get beat up this time, okay? So I'm paddling to shore thinking about spending a day on the beach all by myself. And out of the corner of my eye, I see this flash of motion, you see? And I, I'm almost going to discount it. And then I paddle down the beach and I see crocodile tracks. And, and I look along and I see where the crocodile had been on the beach facing out, looking at me coming in, swam into the water, went down the beach 50 or 100 meters, and crawled up. I go, wow, this is really cool, man. There's a 15-foot man-eating crocodile right here. <laughs> so I went out, I got my camera, you know. I, I'm taking pictures, and then it slowly sinks in, you know. 15-foot man-eating crocodile. Right. <laughs> got it. OK. So. I kind of, these tracks lead into the jungle, and I kind of peer into the jungle, and then I see these two eyes. And the crocodile has gone, has seen me, gone around, gone into the jungle, circled back, 
and it's now buried under the duff except for its two eyes and it's very slowly coming back towards me. I go, oh, okay, this is, this is not good. So I get in my boat and I boogie, I go out in the crossing exactly the wrong time of the tide, I get all beat up, okay, whoa. Okay, so now I didn't die, you know, I made the crossing eventually. So I'm paddling along and now this, this is a game changer in the trip, you see because now I've got winds, I've got currents, I've got storms, I've got rain squalls, I've got crocodiles. And this is something that I'm not prepared to deal with. I've kayaked many, many miles but not had this situation evolve. So as I'm traveling along, I'm stopping in the villages and I meet these guys, you know, I meet the olders, the elders, and the young kids. And this guy was a chaplain, I met him, current ammo, the currency of the new millennium. It's, I don't know if he knew exactly what he was advertising. I meet the fishermen, the guys who are out to sea, and all these guys that I meet, they've been living with crocodiles all their lives. For generations, I say, hey look, you know, I got this problem. There are these crocodiles out there and they want to eat me. How do you deal with the situation? And they say, oh man, not to worry. See, a crocodile isn't like a lion or something. A lion will grab you by the neck and break your neck or rip your juggler vein out and you're dead. Crocodiles don't operate that way. They grab you in their mouths and then they take you underwater and bring you to the bottom and they drown you. So you got lots of time because you can hold your breath. <laughs> so you get in the crocodile's mouth and don't fight, you know, just relax a little bit and you go underwater and just give it a few minutes, take your time, get your orientation of your body position and get all ready and then reach around and poke them in the eyes. It works every time, they'll let you go. I go, okay. So I'm paddling along, you know, kind of rehearsing it, you know, you know, I got it, I got it. I'm under control of this situation. So then I meet this guy. And he goes, hey man, you know, where are you going? I go, I'm going up this way. He says, I'm going that way too. Can I paddle with you for a few days? I say, yeah, that'd be great. It'd be wonderful to paddle with you. And so we're paddling along and the next day we're, it's kind of getting towards dusk and we get to this river mouth and he says, hey, do you mind going up this river with me? I got some friends in this village up river. We'll, go up and party down. I say, yeah, this is a good, good idea. And then I start thinking, you see, I've read the Lonely Planet Guide to the Solomon Islands, and it says crocodiles hunt in river mouths at dusk. And I go, we're in river mouths at dusk. So I, I bring the subject up to him. I says, do we have a problem here? And he says, no, 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 no we don't have a problem. Um, in another river, we'd have a problem, but in this river, these crocodiles are really the reincarnation of my grandfather. <laughs> and because they're in the family, they won't hurt us, and because you're with me, you're cool. <laughs> okay. All right. Where am I going with this story? <laughs> you see, I've spent 40 years traveling in, in many remote places around the globe and when you travel around you meet people with one foot in the 20th or the 21st century and one foot in the Stone Age and you hear a lot of stories like this. My whole book, The Raven's Gift, is about my experiences with the shaman and shamanic healings and so on and so forth. And you go around the country or you listen to stories in the campfire and some of these stories, you know, people roll their eyes, you know, I tell them I've been healed by this old shaman and you meow, people can glaze over. And sometimes when you're in campfires and people tell stories, you kind of glaze over like this one can't be true. The grandfather crocodiles, you know, you know. Okay, so now what I want to do here is take all of these stories, all of these aboriginal stories, of, sh of shamanism, of shamanic cultures, or animistic interactions with the world. And I want, let's take the most preposterous ones, the really outlandish ones, take them out of the pile, 
and put them in a corner over here where we're not going to worry about them. I don't want any people to be stressed out about whether they have to believe in something or not, okay? All right, now let's take the sort of preposterous stories, take them out of the pile and put them over here where we're not going to worry about them. Okay, now let's take even the slightly questionable ones, put them over here. What do we have left? We have left the stories that you have to believe, that are true. I have here a stone axe. This was given to me when I was making one crossing in the Solomons. Somebody said, you have to take this, my grandfather's stone axe with you. It'll give you power. Okay, we live in Montana. You know, people use axes, saws, chainsaws, all those weapons of mass destruction. Now, think about this axe. Now, I want you to imagine going into the tropical forest, finding a big old tropical hardwood tree, two meters in diameter, chopping it down with this axe. All right, and then limbing it and debarking it, yeah, and then shaping a canoe out of it, yeah, and then sailing across two or 3,000 miles of open water with no navigational equipment other than the stars, all right? Now we have to believe in that because it happened. And it, these weren't accidents. Uh, I was in Pol uh, Melanesia here, but people from Polynesia traveled from Polynesia and Micronesia to Hawaii and back. It was a trade route. The mineralogy of stone tools shows that stone tools all over the South Pacific came from Hawaii. There was a return trade. Not to uh, beat a dead horse over the head, this is a harpoon point that I picked up in Northeast Siberia in a cut bank under the permafrost or within the permafrost. It's about as big as my finger. It's made out of a piece of walrus tusk. I want you to imagine taking this harpoon point, tying it on the end of a long stick and going out and hunting walrus, a 3,000 pound animal with hide this thick and big long teeth, fast and agile in the water. Well, people did these things. What we're going to talk about tonight is the power of indigenous wisdoms. What is it in our ancestors that gives us a lesson to learn today in this complex technological world that we live in? Now, I'm going to set my story in, on Ellesmere Island which is one of the most northern points of land in the earth, 84 degrees north. It's the 10th largest island in the world. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the Arctic Circle. This is the distance from the Arctic Circle to the north end of Ellesmere. Now this map is a scale on it is a little bit squinched out by the computer, but you get the idea that we're way closer to the North Pole from the north end of Ellesmere than we are to the Arctic Circle. Way, 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 way north of Montana. <laughs> Why did I pick Ellesmere Island? In 1988, I was following the route of this guy named Kitlock. He was a shaman from southeastern Baffin Island. He was a murderer. He was a madman. He was a quintessential wanderer. My wife, Chris Seashore, and I followed his migration up the east coast of Ellesmere Island and across to Greenland. It was a wonderful trip. Uh, Chris and I had a wonderful marriage. And during the trip, I thought, this is such a beautiful place. This is such a pristine place. All the currents are moving south to north out of the North Pole. For a month, we didn't see a single piece of plastic, a single piece of trash. It was just total, just ice and water and glacier. And I always wanted to go back. So now I found myself in my mid-60s thinking, you know, that age was creeping up on me. And I, I didn't have that much time left to go big. 
And I thought, yeah, I got to go around that island. And then you start doing the math, 1,500 miles. You have 100 days of, of reasonable conditions to travel and what with food drops and, and ice in and ice out, that's 15 miles a day. That's um, half a marathon a day, every day, for over three months over some of the roughest terrain on Earth. Right. Okay. So. There's a guy who lives down here in Stevensville, Tyler Bratt. I knew his dad real well. His dad and I are the same age. He's the younger generation. And I was one of many local uh, West Fork and Lower Bitterroot people who taught Tyler how to kayak when he was little. I remember him when he was six years old. And, and Tyler grew up to be one of the world's most radical whitewater kayakers. He holds the record, the world record for waterfall jumping in a kayak, 187 feet, more than a climbing rope length, off a waterfall. <laughs> right, so I meet Tyler at, at Salt Lake at the trade show one day, and, and Tyler says, hey, John, man, you know, remember those days when you helped teach me how to kayak? Let's, let's do a trip together. Yeah, dude, yeah, okay. And I kind of forgot about it, you know, because he was getting famous and hanging out with all the other 20-year-olds and stuff. And, and then he calls me up. He says, John, remember we said we were going to do something? And I go, okay, we're going around Ellesmere. So <laughs> he says, okay. And, and then we go over the maps and the ice and, and this and that. He says, we need more horsepower, so we need Eric Boomer. So we get Eric Boomer involved. He's another totally world-class whitewater boater that does, you know, so totally amazing things. And the three of us decide to go. Then Tyler jumps the waterfall and breaks his back. It's down to me and Boomer. Okay, we'll get to there. So anyway, here's the route. We start in Greece Fjord. It's the only civilian settlement on the island. 141 people. There's a commercial airstrip there so we can fly in without spending uh, all the money for a charter. Go around, and around, 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 Eureka Weather Station, Canadian Weather Station, we can get a food drop there. And then at McClintock Inlet, we're supposed to get a food drop, it never materialized. Ward Hunt is a place where the North Pole group start. We got a food drop there. Alert, this is where the Canadian military is. Couple more food drops that didn't materialize. As I said, 1,500 miles, 100 days. Got it. Okay, what we're going to talk about today is ice. I've squandered, you know, 15 minutes of my talk before getting to the topic. We're going to talk about ice. This is the polar ice cap. What, where are we going with the ice? This series that we're talking about, the series that you've been in, is how water shapes the landscape. When you think about water shaping the landscape, your first thought perhaps, is in a strict tactile geological sense. If you have a stream and it's running through rock or through soil or whatnot, you have weathering, you have erosion, the water cuts canyons, it shapes valleys, it makes floodplains and all of this. This is all true, of course, but it's only one way that water is shaping the landscape. There's many other interactions, one of which we're going to talk about today. We're going to go to the polar ice cap, as I say. Now, these are little clippings I've cut out of uh, the scientific journal Science. The sea ice is declining. This is 1980. This is 2010. There's fluctuations, but the end all result is that the total extent of sea ice across the whole circumpolar north is declining dramatically with global warming. Um, Arctic sea ice drops to record low. That was this dip right here, and so on. What does this mean? How does this shape the landscape? Why do we care? It's way up there. When you have a little bit of global warming, warm atmosphere melts the ice, melting ice warms the atmosphere, warmer atmosphere melts more ice, blah, blah, blah. 
what happens is we have a feedback mechanism here so that the warming, the changing, the changes of albedo, the changes of, of reflectivity of ice and water all accelerate small changes in temperature and can create what's called threshold effects where all of a sudden things <laughs> spiral out of control. So water, ice, shapes the landscape by being in these complex feedback mechanisms that alter climate. We're going to get back to this. We're going to get on to the trip now, May 7th. You have to figure out the strategy of this trip, you have a very narrow window of open water. You can't do 1,500 miles in the amount of time that you're going to have open water up north. You can do 500 miles a, a month under expedition sea kayaking conditions. You don't have three months of open water. So you've got to operate at sometimes in less than optimal conditions. Now. At the far end in the fall, when the ocean starts to freeze back up again, the ice is too thin to walk on and too thick to paddle through, and you can't do that. It stops you cold. So you have to leave early and travel on spring sea ice. This is the ocean right here. And travel on spring sea ice for a certain amount of time in order to to get far enough going before you hit the open water. Okay, everybody got that? So the whole game is this complicated thing. How many food drops do we have? How much food do we need? How much do we travel every day? What are the temperatures going to be? We chose to decide on May 7th. Why not May 6th or 8th? I don't know. May 7th was the day we chose. Okay, this is uh, the team. We, as I said, we've lost Tyler because of his broken back. This is Eric Boomer, 27 years old. This is John Turk, 65 years old. We barely know each other. We've met two or three times. We've exchanged a few emails. Yeah, that's okay. His friends all told him that he was crazy to go with a geezer. My friends all told me I was crazy to go with somebody so young and inexperienced. He had never been on a camping trip longer than three days before this trip. Um, the beginning of the journey was a trudge. Well, the first 800 miles was a trudge. We're, we're trudging across flat, flat ocean. This is ocean, just uh, temperatures were like you would expect on a winter camping trip in British Columbia, in the mountains of British Columbia in January. So winter temperatures, below freezing for sure, but not real Arctic cold. None of this 40 or 50 below monkey business. I don't think it got colder than, let's say, 25 below. Um, I'm not normally a trudger. You know, I like to ski. I like to climb lines. You look at this and you go, whoa, you know, because that's skiable. Well, no, it closes out here, blah, blah, blah. But um, you're, you're, you put that part of you away. Because you're doing this journey, and everything is about efficiency. I've got to do 15 miles every day. If I do 14 miles one day, you know, if you cut yourself short by one mile a day, at the end of the trip, you're 100 miles short. And you're a week behind schedule. So you're constantly putting yourself into this space of maximum efficiency and and fluidity and moving along. And you would think, I would think it would get boring, but it really didn't. Um, we had some medium severe weather early in the trip, as I say, 20, 25 below and blowing winds. That was okay. We had 24 hour daylight and uh, it was something that we knew we had to move through. Okay, now part of this trip you know, when you're cold, I mean, we're all human beings. We like to be zen and cool and really, really groovy and all that. But we're all human beings when it's 25 below and the wind is blowing and it's howling a uh, uh, ground blizzard conditions. You wish that it would get warmer. You think, oh, man, it would be really nice to get warm. At every stage in the expedition, we wished for what we thought were better conditions. 
And when we got those conditions, they were worse. <laughs> so we wished for warmer weather. We got it. And with the warmer weather, we got heavy, wet, wet snow and where you can travel easily 15 miles a day on good, firm, wind-blown, hard, cold snow when you start getting uh, 30, 40, 50 centimeters of wet slog, you start bogging down. And we started, we started bogging down from 15 miles a day to seven miles a day. So every day you do seven, you say, oh my gosh, I got to do 22 someday down the road to pick it up. Well, conditions ease up, we get beautiful sunshine, we're traveling along, it's a glorious area of flat ice. Now this is not sea ice, this is sea ice, this is a chunk of a glacier that's calved off somewhere from Ellesmere or Axel Heilberg or something and been floating around for a while and got frozen in the ice. These kinds of things, these kinds of structure make photo backdrops. They sink big ships like the Titanic, but they're no threat to a kayak. You're not going to bump into one of them in the middle of the night and, and you know, break a hole in your boat. It just ain't going to happen. They actually make for good camping because there's always a wind shelter on one side of the, the iceberg or another. Ah, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> So we're traveling along in the, in the high 70s, 70, 70 degrees latitude, almost exactly at the point where we hit 80 degrees north latitude. This guy is standing right across the 80 degree north latitude line. Well, not exactly, but pretty darn close. Now, there's a lot of discussion in the Arctic literature What's the difference between high Arctic and polar? But pretty definitely, most people will agree, when you cross 80 degrees north, the North Pole, of course, is 90. When you cross 80, you're getting into the polar zone. You've left the high Arctic. So this guy not only was waiting for us at 80 degrees north, he hung out with us. He camped with us. He bivvied up about a body length or less from our tent, stayed with us all night. So what do you make of this? Well, you see, this is fact. This, this was a wolf. It's a real wolf. We took a picture of it. We're not making it up. But the story around the wolf is any story you want. You can tell the story that this was a bad wolf trying to eat us or this was a scrounging wolf trying to find food. You can tell any story you want, and it's your own business. Now, what I learned, I spent five years off and on in Northeast Siberia among the shamanic peoples, among people, animistic people, and what would they say? Well, they would say, it's the spirit wolf. It's the spirit wolf. He came at just at this time. It's the spirit wolf. And I've spent enough time in this in this environment to agree with them. Hello, Mr. Spirit Wolf. So now I spend the whole night thinking, what's the Spirit Wolf telling me? <laughs> Is the Spirit Wolf guaranteeing me safe passage? No. No. No, no, no. There is no safe passage in the polar zone. That's not the point. Yeah, the magic of vulnerability, embracing uncertainty. It's saying you're coming into the, par the polar zone, my friend. It's dangerous up here. It's cold, it's scary, the wind is going to blow, the ice is going to be rough. Enjoy it. And this is what we're talking about. I think this is the foundation of the environmentalism, of deep environmentalism, which I'm going to talk about over and over again tonight. Because you see, if you don't like uncertainty, when there's uncertainty evolves, what are you going to do? You're going to buy yourself a bulldozer. And if you have greater uncertainty, you're going to get a bigger bulldozer. And you're going to grind things down. You're going to try to push things out of the way. And that's our problem. 
So the polar wolf was telling me, you, you, you might die up here, that's okay, but accept it, be with it. You're entering into this very, very, very dangerous zone. And to me, it was a, a big high point. Boomer and I talked about it. He didn't agree with me at first, but as the trip went on, you know, he started talking about the polar wolf. <laughs> okay. I'm not the first person that's been thinking about this. I'm going to give you just a, a, a 15 second background of um, my own history. I started off as a research scientist, as a chemist, working under a grant from the Environmental Protection Agency on research, basic research that was related to air pollution. I went on from that to becoming an environmental science educator and uh, worked for 40 years, 35 years, uh, first with my father and, and people in Connecticut and then with Gray Thompson who's a professor emeritus at this university who's here in this audience, writing environmental science books. So two of the very important components of the environmental movement, basic research, education about that basic research. And now I've become a science writer, uh, uh, an adventure writer, a public speaker. And this is the third important part. And I bring up this quote because George Schaller is one of the most preeminent wildlife biologists in the world today. He's a scientist, he's been an educator, and what he's telling us is the story of the polar wolf. Can you put a value on a river or the cry of an animal? Unless you can convince people of the spiritual value of the environment, the cause is lost. So there's all these things. Yes, you have to fix the environment technically, but you have to feel what the polar wolf is telling you or the cause is lost. The aboriginal people that I've been traveling among say exactly the same thing. This message comes at you from many different ways. This is Marina, whom I met in Tolovka in northeast Siberia. She said, if you lose the magic in your life, you lose your power. So many people in our world today say power comes from technology. Yeah, technology keeps wings on airplanes and when we all fly in an airplane we're all happy that there's technology that the wings don't fall off. But where does your power come from? It comes from magic. And if you accept that, then you change your whole way of viewing the world. So I'm going to go on on the trip here. Um, we move out to the north coast of the island. At the north coast of the island, there is no land between you and the North Pole. So the North Pole polar ice cap is swirling around. It's driven by winds and currents. It has a tendency, ice forms, it freezes. It has a tendency to smush up and create pressure ridges. These are all pressure ridges, right? So. At the beginning, we had fairly easy travel, and this is a subtle point, it's easy to miss. Along the pressure ridges is blown in snow. So you have wind-blown snow that's packed hard and creates ramps through the pressure ridges. So this is pressure ridge ice, but it's pretty easy to maintain 15 miles a day. It's still cold. This is still good hard snow. So the sun is shining, you know it's cold, so you wish for it to get warmer, of course. Really warm, let's get hot. Let's take our shirts off, here we are. Boomer's got his shirt off, it's hot. We're now uh, into June, and what happens when it gets hot? Snow melts. Snow melts faster than ice. So what happens is these nice ramps of windblown snow melt. And what you le le left with is this angular ice, this pressure ridge ice with no ramps in between. And all of a sudden, your journeying gets harder. And in this kind of stuff, we're still making 15 miles a day, but we're working a lot harder for it. We're traveling over this broken ice in the beginning, uh, we had a disagreement about how heavy our skis should be. Should we go really light or should we go a little heavier? Uh, Boomer chose really light skis. They started to break. 
He kept moving the bindings around. I said, Boomer man, you know, the bindings are supposed to be in the middle of the ski. There's a reason there. But as the ski kept getting shorter and shorter, you know, he's moving the binding towards the front of the ski, doing hobbling along the best we can. Well, now it's getting really angular. We're getting meltwater pools. This is fresh water on top of the ice. The ice is still two meters thick. You can no longer travel by skis at all. Uh, these are the skis I got married in I, to the woman that uh, I showed at the beginning of the picture, Chris, whom I did the trip with in 1988. She died in 2005. I left the skis up there. I left the skis up there. So it's getting warmer and warmer. We're getting lakes. And we're starting to walk through ankle deep, knee deep, crotch deep water, fresh water pools dragging the boats. The traveling is easy, but our feet are starting to swell. We're starting to get sores. Things are starting to break down. Bodies are starting to break down. We were very concerned when we left Eureka. We had 300 miles to go to our next food drop. We had 50 days worth of food. Why did we have 50 days worth of food to go 300 miles? Because that's all the food that would fit in the boat, you see. And, but we were worried if we had really rough ice, that meant we could do six miles a day. Well, six miles a day would put us way behind schedule, but at least we wouldn't die before we got to the next food drop. Then we could worry about that. Um, we were worried that the ice would be really, really rough, but it, it opened up for us. And we had some good traveling to our food drop. We had Pringles and rum. We, we resupplied. Uh, life was good. And day after day of, of walking through ice water starts taking its toll. Uh, at times, now this is still water on top of fast ice, frozen ice. At times, uh, we just sit in the boats with our feet up, not even put it in our cockpits, and go along with our poles. I want you to look at another small technical detail. Look how much freeboard we have. <laughs> That's not a whole lot. What was the problem here? We were in 13 and a half foot boats. Anybody who's a sea kayaker will say, doofus, what were you doing in a 13 and a half boat, foot boat? If you look, these are wilderness systems tsunamis. If you look on the website in the wilderness system tsunamis, it says the 13 and a half boat, the 135, is great for lighter paddlers for weekend getaways. <laughs> it, it turns out that the reason we chose those boats is that they were the biggest boats that would fit in the aircraft that flew to Greece Fjord. Now, it was a, a technical imperative. When we got in the water, we're thinking, oh man, what's going to happen when we really have to paddle these things? Then we start getting to Cape Hecla, the northeast corner. And what's important in your travels is the wind conditions on the day the ice freezes up. If you look at the journals of explorers, most recent and ancient, you find that every year the variability from year to year in the ice is way more dramatic than the variability due to global warming or anything, because it depends on the weather on a specific day. And we hit a zone of really seriously rough ice. Now we're moving along. We're going in sometimes knee deep, thigh deep slush. We're crawling. Yeah, I don't care how zen you are or how much you know you believe in the spirit wolf. When you're crawling in, in super saturated slush and you have 850 miles to go, you're starting to think, oh boy, this isn't really good. You've got 30 foot pressure ridges. Sometimes you'll, we'll be two manning boats over the pressure ridges. Sometimes we'll work for an hour or more to go what ends up to be a horizontal distance of only a couple hundred meters. We're starting to get worried we're behind schedule. What does behind schedule mean? It means we don't have enough food to complete the journey. We're going slower than our food supply than our allotted 15 miles a day. All right, 
So we're thinking, what are we thinking? Now we're wishing for something. We're wishing for something new, new conditions. What we'd like right now is for it to break up so that we can have open water. So look, it breaks up. We got what we wish for. All right, now let me explain what breakup means. We're over here now. You have the Arctic Ocean multi-year ice pack over here. You have 12 miles between Ellesmere and Greenland. You have a current moving north to south. So you have this infinity of ice, this continental chunk of moving, swirling, grinding ice going into a constriction 12 miles wide. All hell breaks loose. This is a massive constriction. Whoops. So now we're trying to move through this moving ice. But notice in the pictures before, you're, you're, walking, you're walking on ice. It might be rough, but you're at least not going to fall through. But now you're in a situation where you have sometimes big pans of ice, a couple kilometers in diameter, and sometimes, you know, basketball or baseball, little churning, moving ice. Here's a 30-foot near vertical ice cliff. Now we're getting scared. So when you get scared, you need some kind of a paradigm to get you out of this mess. You need some kind of a relationship with the environment. What did we learn in kindergarten? Ever, anybody here go to kindergarten? Did you learn this? Right. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. Right. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. I'm going to get tougher than the North Pole ice pack. I'm going to get... No, it doesn't work that way. You see, this whole concept of what the environment teaches you you know, it teaches you on a personal tactile level, but it works on a global level too, whether you believe it or not. It doesn't work to try to overpower the environment, either on a small scale when you're on expedition or on a big scale when we're seven billion people trying to survive until the next century. Okay, let's think of another paradigm that might work. Okay, let me think. Yeah, the military. The military's got pretty good ideas. I, I, let's go on the internet. I, you can do this. You believe me. I'm not making this up. And let's find the military strategy for winning the war in Afghanistan. <laughs> right. Make a flow chart and get all the interconnections and draw lots of arrows around and you get Afghanistan stability. All right. That's not going to work either. It really doesn't. You, you can't logic your way out of this mess. Okay. I've got one. I've got an idea. When the going gets tough, the tough drink tea. And, and this is the concept that when the environment is really powerful, that you have to chill out. Now, there's a whole other talk I could give. I've been on TED Talks and, and, and doing a bunch of stuff. There's a whole concept that's going around now that's scientifically proven that functionability, your ability to deal with the situation, comes from your emotional state. If you go entirely on your technological brain, you don't function as efficiently as you do from the heart. If you have a calm emotional state, you're better off. Sit down and wait. Every adventurer knows that. There's a time when you drink tea, when you bivy up, when you hang, when you wait. When you let the environment do its thing. This is what we're learning from the shamans. This is Mulanath, the head character, the main character in my book, The Raven's Gift. She, when that picture was taken, she was 96 years old. She was born during the reign of Tsar Nicholas II. If you live in the Stone Age, dealing with these tools, okay, here we go. These guys lived in northeast Siberia during the Ice Ages. Yeah, you're hungry, it's 50, 60 below. You tie the proverbial harpoon point on the end of a long stick, and you go mammoth hunting. These guys hunt in the 
in the polar seas in boats made out of sticks and walrus or seal hide. If you live like that, then you realize that your emotional level has to lead you into the technological world. And that's the point of my talk today, that water shapes the environment. If we're going to live on this planet in this watery environment, with this water that has all this multifactual effects, cascading effects, it has to come first from the heart. Okay, that's all fine and dandy, but we had to get out of this mess or we were gonna die. <laughs> so, we were on the satellite phone a lot, and this guy, the Canadian Coast Guard, everybody was starting to get worried about us, and the Canadian Coast Guard guys, they were really nice, they wanted us to uh, live, and I think also they didn't want to have to come get us. They came up and they said, we got a really good idea, guys. Go out through this mess and find yourself a nice big ice flow. The currents are moving north to south and just ride it all the way to Newfoundland, you know, just, just don't fight it, you know, get out there. So now you have to understand all this stuff is moving, it's grinding, it's it's going with the tides, you know, the currents are going, the winds are So we drop into this stuff with very, very scared that we're going to get smushed. And we go out there, you know, jumping from thing to thing in this moving, smashing ice. Oh, jumping along, you know, we're longlining the boats now. When things are too scary, that you're afraid they're not going to stay right side up. We were longlining the boats. You'd you take a long line and you'd run until you'd find a, a stable flow and then you drag the boats up to you. Hey, and then we found the big flow. Yeah, okay. We were looking for a big, thick flow. Things were mashing and getting mashed up. <laughs> Chunks of ice were crashing into the air. We wanted to be on the masher flow, you know. If something was going to get mashed, it wasn't going to be us. We were going to be the mashers. We found this big, thick chunk of multi-year ice. We set camp and we go, we're going to Newfoundland, you know, this is really good. <laughs> so it's all good. We're going about three tenths of a mile an hour, you know, which isn't all that good, you know, but it's still seven or eight miles a day. I'm looking at my GPS. Boomer's taking a nap. Hey, see, I look, a, hey, Boomer, man, you wake up. Whoa, what do you want? What do you want? Turn on your GPS. What's going on here? Oh. We're going the wrong way. We got caught in the back end and we were headed straight north, two and a half miles an hour back into the polar ocean. We said, we got to get out of here. And then, then the back eddy starts closing up. The ocean opens up. It slams back together. The ice starts smashing up and our smasher flow starts breaking up underneath us, you know, and it, it's shaking, you know, there's ice, like you're in an earthquake, there's waves going through it, cracks opening, it's breaking in half, it's splintering, we, we gotta get out of here. So we make a mad dash for shore, woo, woo, okay, we got, you, we got to shore, we were, you know, we only lost a couple of miles in, in a day and a half, and uh, we, we didn't die. All right, so now, uh, we've got kind of shallow water here, and these big chunks of ice are underwater quite a bit, so they're grounding out on the land, so we can move along. We have a little shore lead along, along, along the edge. We're moving along. Sometimes the ice smushes up against the land, and we have to drag them over the ice. Sometimes it really smushes against the land. We have to portage. We're making sometimes one and two miles a day. We're getting seriously behind time. We ate up a third of our food going basically nowhere. We're, we're pushing as hard as we can. We're making a mile, two miles, three miles a day at the most. Um, struggling, pushing through the ice. We don't even get in our boats. We sit in them, we have crampons on, we're out, we're in, we're dragging, we're pulling. We're moving a mile or so a day. Every day we're getting 14 miles behind schedule. Our food supplies are going down. Rescue here is sort of unthinkable. There's no way you're gonna land a fixed wing plane on this. There's no helicopter within fuel range. So if you call up and you say, this is really scary, I'm really nervous, I don't like this, could you come pick me up? Uh, the answer is no. Um, again, we're, we're running low on time. 
I want to make a, a quick statement that these people out here think we can drill for oil in this environment and run ships up and down and have, you know, floating drilling rigs and all that and move pipe on the ice and nothing's going to happen. Okay, let's skip that one. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, it took us 17 days to go this distance. Now, all along here are cliffs. So along here we have a shallow coast, shallow beaches. We can go a mile, a half a mile, 200 meters, whatever it is, and then come to shore. But here we have to go 15 miles at a whack. And if we miss it and the ice closes in on us, we're dead. We're smushed up against the cliffs and we're dead. There's no question. You're not going to survive that at all. It's steep vertical shale. There's no way you're going to get out of that mess. So watch the weather, watch the weather, satellite phone, Canadian Coast Guard finally made a break for it. As I say, 17 day, days to do this, 17 hours to do this, 55 miles of mostly cliffs from Cape Sheridan to good camping right here. Meow. Um, and it, it, was, it was something we did in the middle of the night. We left at 9 at night. Uh, paddled uh, until we were exhausted, stopped, camped, brewed up, drank some water, cooked a little, slept for an hour, and continued on for our 17-hour push. Breakout, freak out, we made it, we didn't die. Uh, got to the starvation camp of Adolphus Greeley. These were guys who came up. You see, the ice is so different every year because it depends basically on which way the wind is blowing. Because you have moving ice, it all depends on the direction of the wind. So when Greeley came out up here, he, he came up in a big old wooden sailing ship with a little steam engine in it, you know. And there was plenty of water. They just motored right on up. And they said, wow, this is pretty cool. This Arctic is friendly. They sent the ship back down for food. And of course, the ship couldn't make it the next year, the next year, the year after. And two thirds of them starved to death. Um, we're moving along here. And slowly we get past the constriction. We're still in thick ice, but things are opening up. We're finding patterns and paths through it. We start to pick up speed. We're, we're heading towards winter. We're heading towards running out of food, but we're starting to make, oh yeah, and then this guy shows up, yeah. Well, you know, there's something about living with polar bears. <sighs> We had nine aggressive polar bear attacks, not attacks, nine aggressive polar bear encounters in one day. This guy bit a little hole in our tent while we were sleeping. It, it's part of the whole relationship. We had a 12 gauge, of course, because we're not stupid. You know, we're technical people, we're armed, we're dangerous predators, they're dangerous predators. But at the same time, living in such close proximity to polar bears it's just another one of those stories. It's just like the ice or the walrus or anything else. You intentionally, remember earlier I said, the magic of vulnerability. If you don't find magic in there, don't go. Uh, slowly making our way. Now we're getting open water. Now we're making up for the last time. I'm starting to feel my body beyond fatigue. I'm starting to feel it's gone someplace that I've never put it before. And it's sort of interesting and at the same time a little bit nerve-wracking. Um, we're paddling along, big glaciers coming down to the sea, making your way. Now we're pushing 20, 25. We never hit a 30-mile day. We always got some ice or a storm or something closed in on us. It's late August. We're headed towards winter. The sea is freezing up at night. It's still daylight, but it's colder at night. And like I say, the, the last few days before we got into Greece Fjord, I said to Boomer, I said, Boomer, man, you know, I, I'm so tired it's worrying. I don't know what it is, but my body just has had <coughs> enough. We made it, we finished it, as I said, 104 days, 1,500 miles, pulled in, partied down on some chips and salsa, 39 hours later, my body totally shut down metabolically. Um, 
I was dying. The, the nurse at the nursing clinic in Greece Fjord, they took my vital signs, what she could take, called them into a medical team down south at Johns Hopkins, and they said, get that guy. Go get him. Get him out of there, because he doesn't have very long to live if he doesn't get to a hospital. I had insurance. Anybody here who goes into remote places, get insurance with these guys, Global Rescue. They advertise, we'll come get you anywhere in the world, any latitude, any elevation. They flew a jet plane, a Learjet, an air ambulance Learjet up as far as the pilot would go. They landed the RCMP, um, Canadian ambulance, air ambulance wouldn't fly in the storm. They found a pilot who would fly in under the weather. They came and got me. They flew me down to Ottawa. I didn't die. We completed the trip. Thank you all very much. I ran a little long. I'm going to make two quick announcements. I do have books for sale. I know many of you in this room have bought and read my books. Thank you. But those who didn't, I have some. Number two is we're, bring, we're taking this whole story that I'm telling you. I'm working with a modern dance company in Boston, a professional dance company. We've played in, in Boston and San Francisco. We're bringing this to Missoula. In the fall, any of you uh, who are interested, I appreciate if you can. It's a really great thing. Okay, thanks. Uh, questions? Yeah. Are you still friends with Boomer? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Boomer and I are our best buddies. I mean, we don't see each other. You know, he's closer in age to my grandchildren than to my children. Um, but we're sharing the podium. We have a bunch of talks down in Colorado. We're going to share the podium together. And uh, yeah, yeah, he's a great guy. We had a great, great, great time together. Yeah. What was wrong with you physically at the end of the trip? Uh, we were just talking about that. Basically, my, um, my the cortisols and the, uh, all the adrenaline in my system was keeping things you know, I was, my whole body was inflaming. My prostate, which is already big, I'm an old man, flamed up, shut off the urethra, no peeing, backed up the kidneys, kidneys shut down, body starts shutting down. Yeah. Why were you bleeding at the beginning? Why, was, why were you bleeding when you woke up? Oh, yeah, old man story again. I was on a sitting top kayak and, um, you don't have that control with your thighs under the deck, so you drive the boat with your butt. And boy, it didn't take long sitting in salt water and driving a boat with your butt. I had no idea, because usually you take that pressure off and you drive with your thighs. And my, uh, yeah, so I got all scabbed up, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. How did you store your food? You know, not having trees, hang like bear boxes and things. Oh, yeah, no, 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 you know, don't let any bear expert, uh, you know, don't tell a bear expert at Yosemite this. Basically, what you do is you put your food in the boats, tie the boats to the tent. So if the bear starts trying to get into the boat, he'll jiggle the boat, jiggle the tent, you come out, and you yell at the bear. As <laughs> Don't do that. It's bad bear. <laughs> yeah. What was the biggest contribution Boomer made to the trip and the biggest contribution you made to the trip? Oh, I don't know about that one. Um, Boomer is amazingly strong. I'm not amazingly wise, so maybe Boomer had the biggest contribution. He's way strong. He, he, you know, these boats, well, they were loaded to 300 pounds uh, when we left Ward Hunt Food Drop. And we get these big vertical sections of ice and we'd have to pull these boats over. And I go, hey, Boomer Man, could you give me a hand? You know, I can't, you know, this is the 15th one in a row. And you got a 300 pound boat to lift over. And, and he said, could you give me a hand? Could we two man these boats? 
And he'd walk over and look at me, you know, like, what's wrong with you? And he'd just grab my boat and he'd p push it up on top of the ice. You know, and just kind of look back like, do you have a problem? Um, w w he was really, really strong. Uh, whether, you know, I contributed anything or not is for him to say. Yeah. What percentage of the trip did you actually float in the water versus <laughs> Yeah. Um, we, we were on foot about 850 and then we paddled the rest. And once we started paddling, then we could significantly do more than our 15 miles a day. So that's where we made up for last time. Yeah. Oh, I really like this George Shuller quote. Wait, wait a minute, start again. The George Shuller quote. Yeah. Unless you convince people the spiritual value of the environment that causes loss, you really right. believe in that. And I'm wondering, since most people in the world can't go certain at the Ellesmere Island and really connect yeah. to phases like that, yeah. how would you suggest modern people achieve that? Oh, thank you, thank you. That's a wonderful question. Eloise Thompson, who's in the audience here, we were talking about this one day, and she said, yeah, that's all good and wise, John, but you need to be hit over the head with a very heavy stick. <laughs> um, the question, the, the thing is that, you know, I'm a little slow on the uptake, so I need to be hit over the head with a very, very st heavy stick. To appreciate the environment, you don't have to walk around Ellesmere Island. It's a metaphor. You know, I did it, but it's a metaphor. But it's not the only way. There's 843 gazillion ways to achieve that sort of thing without, um, w without doing something stupid, like going around Ellesmere Island. My friend Denny Eberl, who's who is a climber, um, very world-class climber, and now it spends a lot of time in meditation, says, John, you don't have to do it that way. There's other ways to get there. You know, haven't you learned that yet? So, yeah, it's, um, yeah, y you can appreciate the environment without going to extremes. Tell us a little more about the traumas. About what? About the traumas. The traumas? Shamans. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm really sorry. I don't hear very well. Oh, you have to read the Raven's Gift. But, but, but basically, um, I, I'll try to tell that, you know, really quickly. I had an old avalanche injury, you know, I was busted up. I was traveling across the tundra. I got busted up again. I came in and she said, oh, that's no problem. You brought me reindeer meat. Stand on one leg. Put one hand behind your back, the other hand straight out in front of you and uh, I'll heal you, and she went to the other world, and she talked to Kutcha the raven, and Kutcha flew to the woman who lives on top of the highest mountain, I got better. So n now the rest of the book is trying to figure out what's going on in that relationship, and it leads you to, I come back, I say, I want to thank you for healing me. She says, no, you, you have to go to the other world, you have to thank Kutcha. I eat the magic mushroom, I go to the other world, I get scared, I come back. It's a long story. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to brush over it too fast, but it is a long story. Yeah, Mark. Uh, earlier you said that some of the food drops did not materialize. Right. So what did you do? We uh, had less food. <laughs> I mean, on your way there, you had a little extra food to begin with. You get to where there's supposed to be food drops. Well, well we, knew, we knew ahead of time that the food drops didn't make it because the ice was too rough, because weather was wrong, planes weren't flying. So we actually didn't have enough food to do the trip. And then um, we ended up raiding an emergency food cache at, the, at Fort Conger. And that was okay with the Park Service. We, t we talked to the Park Service about it. And, um, they said, that's what it's there for. This was a starvation camp. We don't want anybody ever to starve there again. Raid that food row. Raid that. So we raided with permission from the Canadian Park Service. Full knowledge. Yeah, other without that, we would have been in trouble. Yeah. yeah um, I was wondering if uh, you thought the bear maybe was talking to you for some, you know, the wolf at the beginning, the bear at the end. Right. If there was some message, or was it just a uh, bear bitter? Well, of course, <laughs> yeah, I mean, 
of course there's a message. And it's a message, it's the same message that you're vulnerable. And that you're relating to the environment in this respectful way. Bears are, are interesting. A bear guy in Kamchatka once told me, um, when you see a bear, I, when you see a bear, how are you going to relate to that bear? Do you act aggressive or submissive? And the bear biologist said, if, it, if that bear is, a, is a, a mean old male on the top of the bear hierarchy who's used to bullying people around, you act submissive. If that bear is low in the hierarchy of bears and used to getting pushed around, you act aggressive. So I said, well, you know, how do you know that? And he said, you better learn fast before a bear eats you. <laughs> and and th the lesson is that if you act respectful, if you are totally aware as much as you can, you have a better chance. It doesn't guarantee it. The bear still can eat you. No matter how good you are, <coughs> things can go against you. But to live in that environment, we had so many bear encounters. We had nine in one day. To live in that environment day in and day out is the same message that the spirit wolf was telling us. Embrace uncertainty. Embrace invulnerability. Enjoy it. This is what you're here for. Um, was there any change in uh, the landscape since you've been there? Is there what? Did you see any notice of change that you could notice? Yeah, yeah, I, I did. And I'm sorry I don't have a photograph of it. Because remember that earlier photograph of Chris in the green kayak with that big uh, Tidewater Glacier? Well, we, we came to the same place. And I, I looked on the map. I looked on the GPS. We were in exactly the same place where I took that picture. And there was no glacier at all. Actually, there was a, like an ice field that just came gently down to the sea. And I took a picture of it and went, wow, before and after. Then when I was editing the photos, I looked at that photo and I said, what did I take a picture of this dumb little snowfield for? And while it was still on the camera, when you can't retrieve it, I pushed delete. And as soon as I pushed delete, I read, realized that's the before and after picture of the Alfred Newman Glacier. So yeah, there's massive changes from 1988 to now in the uh, extent of the glaciation. Yeah? I just wondered what the inhabitants uh, there in that little community at Ellsworth Island, what they, if they talk about climate change, what they've been noticing in their lives. Sure, sure. The, they live on the ice. They hunt on the ice. Um, it, it's very, very tricky. It's very, very tricky. And I've seen too many exaggerations in the literature. Um, because sea ice is two meters thick. If it decreases by 10%, it's still thick enough to walk on. I've seen people say that because of global warming, you can't walk on the sea ice anymore. Well, that's just simply not true. And what happens is, that the, the ice doesn't melt, it, it cracks and it breaks up and it starts moving around and floating. So then the, the direction and position of the winds and the intensity of the winds affects things. So it, it's very, very complicated. But the bottom line is that in August, when you used to have Lots of ice, seals and polar bears. Now, at the end of August around Greece Fjord, we did not, the last week, we did not see a single piece of ice. So the, the change is huge. And with that change comes massive changes in the ecosystem, in the distribution of animals. And if you're living as a hunter, the changes in the distribution of animals are a matter of life and death. How are we doing? Uh, are we we running out of time? A couple more minutes. We got a couple more minutes. Yeah. What's next? Ah, 
Well, when I was in the hospital, you know, I, they, they finally medevac me here to St. Pat's. When I was in St. Pat's, I, I made a statement that I was going to uh, quit expeditioning forever. But that isn't true. <laughs> I, I, I've met this magical guy, Malu Bean, in Xingqiang Province in the Altai Mountains. And Malu Bean and I are going to go on a mountain bike ride to the birthplace of the Dalai Lama. Um, coming up, that, that that's in the planning stages right now. But we're not. It's not going to be as hard as this trip by a long shot. Yeah. How long did it take you to prepare for a trip like this? I, I'm not the right person to ask about this because I do things a little haphazardly. Um, about ten months. I probably should have. You know, some guys take a year couple years. Uh, we, we just, you know, our temperaments wouldn't, if, if you planned it, like when Tyler got hurt, and people said, would you put it off a year? There's no way we could put it off a year because it doesn't work that way. About 10 months. Yeah. So you travel around the world to very remote uh, places and you meet with indigenous populations. How do you commu communicate with them? People? With people? Uh, oh. Oh, that's a really good question. Yeah, it's so complicated. Sometimes we hire interpreters. Sometimes we luck out. Um, in Canada, of course, they speak English. In, in Russia, I ended up uh, traveling for several years with this magic, magical man named Misha, who interpreted for me, who was also my expedition partner. One year, we had an interpreter, and he said, this is a job from hell and quit. And um, we traveled the whole year without communicating with anybody. <laughs> one more. We'll go for one more. One more lucky person. Yeah. All right. So not knowing Boomer prior to the expedition, how did you guys overcome differences, any kind of obstacles between your personalities? Yeah. That's, that's another really good question. And it, it's about leadership. And leadership, I've been working on this a lot uh, with um, actually with some corporate people, IT people in Silicon Valley. Um, Gray and I, Gray Thompson, who's in the audience here, were partners for many decades in a lot of big climbs. And if you look back at our, at our history of our relationship, we traded leadership at times. Sometimes I can remember times where I said, man, I'm really beat, Gray. You, you take over. I can't do this. And I can remember it the other way around. And I think in a situation of this, of this nature, the importance is to assume and relinquish leadership when you realize that you are the strongest or you are not the strongest at that moment. And if leadership becomes an ego thing, you're dead. And if it becomes a, a, a realization that the team has to survive, and Boomer and I traded leadership. And um, I think you know that we're lucky that we were able to do that, because if we hadn't, we wouldn't have made the trip. I think we're done. Thank you all very much.